On this episode, I'm taking you on a business trip with me behind the scenes, the fun kind where your girlfriends and you just get together and actually one person is the host and kind of mixes up the group. So some of us have gotten together a lot and some of us are a little bit newer together, but behind the scenes, we were talking about stuff in business, like stuff we see online and things that aren't working and things that we, we were having the conversation. I said, no, we are going to go to the table and we are going to record this and it is going to be a podcast. So if you were a person who is thinking thinking about wanting to get into entrepreneurship or into private practice or a dietitian, if you're in the fitness field, if you have any interest, this is the episode for you. And before we get started, I just want to thank our VIP sponsor, Ruba Health, who's a lab concierge service that I use to order blood testing through Access Medical Labs for almost $5 a marker for really good labs. It's super handy. I also use it for other testing that I do if I'm doing mold testing or I want to go ahead and just not log into all these different portals and get it all in one space. It is so easy to use. It's a free account. And I guess I just love passing on that savings to my clients. So you can get a free account if you're a practitioner by going to rupahealth.com. I think it's wonderful. They have been awesome and so easy to work with. And the other thing I love about them is that they act as the concierge. So they help the clients find the labs as well as not naming any names, but there is a micronutrient testing company that I just could not handle the admin for, and they take care of everything. They make the forms, they get them sent out, and they never lose the test. So they are so valuable for so many reasons. Um, If you're a practitioner or you want to consider offering testing, Rupa Health has an amazing backend health portal for those that have a free account. So go over to Rupa Health, sign up, let them know I sent you so they keep hanging out with us over here on the podcast. All right. On this episode, I am surrounded at a table. Here's the stage. We're in, we're at a kitchen table in Minnesota, gathering as a group of dietitians plus one. And everyone's kind of got a little different background. They do different things. So I'm just going to like briefly introduce you to who is here. And we're going to go around and talk about yesterday. We were having a chat about what it takes to have a business, what you wish you would tell yourself to your earlier self. Uh, There's a couple of girls here that teach men, like a few that teach other practitioners, you know, how to be successful in either private practice or in their health professional world. And there's just so many lessons that we've learned over the years. And so we're dumping those yesterday. And I thought the world would really like to know the, the other women and maybe men, maybe the few men would really like to know what it's like if you are, because we're in a transition time of people wanting to get out of the typical workspace. People have like reached a ceiling. They want to consider, they're considering going out on their own. And so we have a little bit of everybody. We have people that are owning, that are owning the business. And then there are people that are working in other people's businesses. Some of those businesses are here. And so there's a couple versions of this because maybe not everyone is cut out to build an entire practice from scratch, but they'd love to work behind the scenes. And that's a beautiful place to be in. (laughs) There's so many opportunities. So we're going to talk a little bit today about advice to early business owners, what we wish we'd have known, the things that we thought, (laughs) the things that we thought we would know um, that we didn't know, just things like that. So here is who is at our little round table. Uh, Robin Johnson is here and you have, how long have you been in practice? Robin? I've been clinically since 2014. So eight years. And then I've owned my private practice since, or for five years. And you worked in like a PT practice. Yeah, I built the nutrition company within a physical therapy office. Yeah. So you did like everything mm-hmm. at that place. Yeah. And we, so I didn't have the financial risk, but I had the risk of losing a job. Yeah. yeah you yeah. have to have some fire in your ass. Mm-hmm. Some yeah. Part. We, um, several of us met working, I'll shout out Ashley Sweeney because she was our connector. Um, we met because we were working in a fitness influencers program around fasting and weight, weight, essentially weight loss. It could have been anything in like 2017 ish. So Robin, Kaylee, Emily, um, field, and I met that way. But anyway, so Emily is sitting next to Robin at the table. Emily, when did you start your practice? Probably uh, 2017, and I was out on my own 100% by 2019. Okay, cool. And you, so Robin, you're in an essentially integrative and functional space, women's health, et cetera. And what would you say you do, Emily? I work mostly with uh, female athletes, and I use that word on purpose because uh, I think a lot of women don't consider themselves athletes, but if they care about their fitness, they like to work out their athletes. So um, I started out of CrossFit gym. So similar to you, I started somewhere else and um, then went out on my own and I take a macro based nutrition approach. 
in my practice. Yeah. So I always, I remember telling Emily, like you are the macros expert and you must share and like tell women about this because there is so much accidental failure in like composition, body composition. Mm -hmm. Um, and we maybe we'll dabble into how the trend now is like helping women eat more because of like just shit, um, dogma from the past. But anyway, next to Emily is Maria, um, Sylvester Terry from, I'm from New Orleans. Yeah. So tell us about like, you are sitting, I mean, everyone, we've got diversity here. So like, tell us about your yes. beginnings. Um, so I actually was not a dietitian to start. I was a late bloomer. I was an English teacher for six years and then changed careers to be a dietitian, moved to New Orleans for my dietetic internship and never looked back and decided to go out on my own, um, you know, like six months ago to open my own private practice full time. And it has been a whirlwind. I would have never done it without Emily. So in so many ways, we're all connected and related in a beautiful way. And it's just been a learning process. So every day is an opportunity to win and lose and you learn from it. That's how I feel. So I think if I was listening to this, because so like mentorship is a big thing to me. And I, I don't think this is true all the time, but it's true a lot of the time. It's not only what you know, it's who you know, like massively. And we actually all know each other only by who we know. <laughs> We're only sitting at this table by who we know. So when you said, I wouldn't have done this without Emily, who's sitting next to you, Emily Field that's sitting next to you. Why is that? Like, how did that end up? Like, how did you two connect? Um, and why did that? Does that make, like, yeah, I'm going to yeah. have you take so I that. I think it was, we follow each other on Instagram. And while my audience is so similar to Emily's, my approach is quite different because my folks are, are really all or, strong, all or nothing thinkers that are trying to unlearn their dieting behaviors, but it's all they've ever known. So they really are starting at zero. So the way I help them find their healthy habits might look different from Emily, but we tend to talk about the same things. So our content overlap in some capacities. We found each other funny. I think we just sort of, like, <laughs> silly <laughs> and um it became I remember distinctly where I was in my house it was like pandemic time I was finishing my dietetic internship and Emily sent me a voice message and was like if you need anything like, you need a mentor you just need somebody to ask questions to like I will do that I was really surrounded by the online coaching space which is very much like if you pay me x number of dollars per month then I will answer your questions and to have someone just say hey if you, if you have a question feel free to ask. I care about you. Um, so that really set the tone of, wow, like that that's a really kind space. Um, and to know that I have like an ally in this space, someone who believes in me and doesn't see me as competition. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. So that's sort of how that started. I said, oh, I got this job. Everything's fine. And then two years goes by and I said, I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. He said, freaking go for it. That's generous. I mean, I feel like maybe, maybe one of Emily's core values is generosity or something. Um, or something, or something. So we'll get back to, let's not forget to come back to the business space later. Cause like you can get, the main point is that you, you, it's hard to do things without some kind of mentorship. Even you, Robin, starting back here, like you had mentor, like you had very clear mentors. Especially, well, yeah, both on the clinical and business side. Right. And if you don't have Mentors, you have to just keep seeking them out. Like you had, what was your mentorship experience like? And um, you yeah, just no, figured yeah, out. The, <laughs> no, the um, nutrition bloggers, the dietitian bloggers back in the day were really, really helpful for me uh, to me, and they like believed in me and they posted my stuff. They worked with me, and that chatter really helped boost me. In the and meeting. how did you um, build those relationships? Um, I think really, I just. Okay. It's weird, but I get along really well with Gen Xers. <laughs> and uh, a couple of those bloggers are in their 40s and they were looking for that next thing. And they heard about macros and they sought out uh, the macro expert, or at least I was posting about it. I was podcasting about it. I was writing articles about it. And so comes along a few of them. And then they hired me and they helped me. I, I think they helped improve my business from the inside out because they were clients I really wanted to impress. And I looked up to them a lot. So Reagan Jones was one of them and like one, probably the most prominent of that. And then we just became friends and she's, it's one of those things. Like if you never need, if you ever need anything, like, let me know. Yeah. It was really yeah. nice. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there was times where you met these people in person. Did you meet them in person mm -hmm. at some things? I yeah. know you'd gone to some blogger. And see, and and things. Yeah. yeah. And if um, someone here, if you're like, oh, I wish I knew more about XYZ, what she does. Emily's already been on the podcast like two or three times. So you just have to go look for her name. So I um, we're stealing. I'm like weighing down one side of the table. But as I continue to go around, Kaylee, <laughs> Kaylee McDevitt is sitting next to Maria. And Kaylee, like, when did your business start and what did you um, do? Yeah, I started my practice in 2017, but I wasn't full time in it until the start of 2019. I was like still doing some contracting part-time stuff on the side. Um, 
and I work in women's health. Um, but you started in sports started and in, in a sports. gym as well, yeah, right? I work in a couple of different gym settings. And even my private practice, I worked out of a CrossFit gym for like the first couple of months. And then it was very clear that that was not <laughs> not the, the space I wanted to be in, but it was great because it gave me permission to start my private practice. The gym owner was a friend of mine and it was like the sign that I needed to take the leap. And then I was working, I created a nutrition program for a large OBGYN practice in Long Beach, California, and was working for them while building my practice too. And um, kind of just getting my feet wet in all things women's health. It was like the full age range of women that I could see um, and realize that that's where I wanted to be. And haven't looked back. Yeah. Great. What I hear is that I tried thing. I'm and as you speak, it makes me think of like my first website that I ever built, and it's like so cringy. Um, <laughs> but you That's just a cringy website. You're doing <laughs> right. If you didn't have a cringy website, you just start somewhere. And I remember like taking. You thought you wanted to be in sports. Literally, like I think your master's was even targeted yeah. that way, right? And then you get into that space and you realize, I actually, don't even really like this as much as I thought I did. Um, so the point is, is like where you start is not where you land later. Yeah. So you can't be afraid to like start somewhere necessarily. Right. Um, so sitting next to Kaylee is Emily Morris, who I always call by her maiden name, but Emily, and it's funny, like going back to Emily Field, I met in 2010, um, going to public policy workshop, if there's side, she shouldn't listen to this, like as she was a student. And then I was friends with, which is funny because Emily Morris, I also went to a public policy, we were roommates for like five days and ate all the food in DC. And why I think Emily's experience is valuable is you were having the feeling that if someone is, if someone's listening to this podcast and they're like, mm, I'm not really digging my job. I don't really feel like I can do anything. I don't feel like I'm able to make a difference in the way I really could make a difference because actually you can make a huge difference in this space. That's like where you were after we met. Mm -hmm. And so tell us about that. Yeah. So I think when we met, um, I was in grad school and when I, was at the end of grad school, um, going to my first job, I started a blog with one of my friends from grad school and we were very passionate. We wanted to be in private practice. We didn't want to do the traditional dietitian job. And so we're like, we'll start a blog. We'll start seeing clients. We really didn't know what we were doing, but we knew that we wanted to just go a different direction. So we did that, doubled our toes in it and got into that space and just realized it's not what I want to do. I don't want to own a business. I don't want to be um, the one in the like running the private practice. And so the stars didn't align on that. We both went our separate ways, ended up in different jobs. And then I ended up in more of a traditional dietitian role and also didn't like that, like knew, kind of went back to like, this is why I started a blog. I didn't want to be in a traditional, um, like clinical or outpatient dietitian role and was in that space for like two to three years and then just got a little bit antsy. And so started, um, looking for other outlets. And in 2020, when I started working from home and had a little more time on my hands, I reached out to a couple dietitians and was like, Hey, I just really don't like my job. And I want some like extra work on the side. Um, and was able to pull some hours together on the side and built that over time and was able to leave that job and um, move into the private practice space supporting Emily Field. So, and I, yeah. And we talked about this a lot over mm -hmm. Boxer. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> um, like, I wish I was doing something else. I'm like, just find someone you like and yeah. ask them if they, like, everyone needs support and help and everyone would love to have. So, the thing that Emily is not like just maybe accidentally forgetting to tell you that I think is valuable is that I've had past clients ask me, could I maybe work for you? Mm -hmm. Just like a few or people. I think that's a thing is like, oh, if you're listening to this, what a cool alternative avenue you yeah. could get out of your space and work with someone else and have a dream job. But Emily does have skills. So um, she has skills because she like built a website once and then we built a website mm -hmm. together and like wrote the copy and yeah. you did like some online graphic work and not like everyone needs that. Like there's so many different things that you could do, but Emily who these Emily's work together. Like looking at the other end of the table with Emily, if em this Emily didn't have any skills, she would have not been a very useful part of your team, right? Absolutely not. And to Emily's credit that she's not saying is like, you do have to hustle a little bit. So mm -hmm. even though she doesn't want to own the business and be the front facing entrepreneur side, she hustled to get her job because she was like, poked me and poked me. And I was like, I don't think I need this. And then I was like, actually, I really do need this. And then she like, <laughs> you know, one thing I credit Emily to is like, she's will say, this is how I can take something off your plate. So if you see a hole Beautiful. in somebody else's business, go after it because I don't even know. I don't know what I don't know. Like, I don't know how she could help me, but she definitely filled a gap, a gap that was definitely there. Um, 
you know, and as an entrepreneur, sometimes you like one of the things that I think holds us back is we are the bottleneck in our business. Like we have to be the one that's delegating to multiple people. But if somebody can come in and be creative and say, here's what I can take off your plate. Here's what I can do for you. You're like, suddenly the world opens up and you have free time to do other things like as the entrepreneur in the face of the business. Yeah. And you poked the other girl, like you just yeah. liked these people online and you're like, Hey, Hey, give me a job. <laughs> right. But you didn't yeah. say it like that. I you found, you found, you found yeah. a way to be useful because we've all gotten uh, several of us have gotten pitches or offered, like if you're an intern or someone looking for hours, you know, I work with Jenna and Kaylee works with Jenna and Jenna asked me, she wrote a really good pitch and she wanted to drive almost five hours to my home to shadow me years and years ago. And here she is. She's still there. Right. Yeah. You just, you have to have some skills is the point. Um, and I mean, you can't have skills without like trying and sucking at stuff. Yeah. And I think the other part is that I also was willing to accept whatever the offer was. So when I, um, I worked for another dietitian, when I first got into private practice, um, along with Emily, I was working for two people and I was working for Megan for five hours a week and M Emily for three hours a week. And like Emily offered me three hours a week. And I think some people would be like, well, that's like, what can I do with that amount of time? But that was what it able, like I did that and I built that and built that and built that and then was able to quit my full-time job. So I just, whatever the offer was, I was like, cool, I'll do it. Like it's anything. So yeah. that, I think that's an important piece is like, there are so many people that need support and depending on where someone is in their business, they may or may not be able to give you much space or time, but it's a door and it's a connection. Yeah. And then once you know one person, maybe you work for a couple people. Um, I think one of like the fears that holds people back, and I, I don't have a solution for it, but we'll just acknowledge it, is that people are concerned about their benefits or whatever, all those pieces. And so and people will say like, when do you jump? You jump when like whatever your side is exceeds now. Oh, <laughs> you or, this is Robin here. We yeah, yeah. can plan and build a bit of a business curveball account so that you have a little bit of security because people are scared to jump and then some people will wait until it's equal but you need the time to be able to build it yeah. to the revenue that you want and so you want to be desperate preparing to jump before but having i mean you know, think through the worst case scenario it's mm -hmm. unlikely to happen that you're not going to have any revenue for three months but have a backup plan so that you you know yeah. just it's a little bit easier yeah speaking of support the last person at the table and i should mention like Emily Field is the hostess in Minnesota. And so it is it's who you know here, but we have another um, person that works with Emily, um, who is Kristen Bondenstein, uh, Bondenstein. Bondenstein. Yeah, Bondenstein. And your history is pretty interesting as well. So tell us about like how you, uh, how you are sitting here at the table. <laughs> I will enlighten everyone that I am the only person that is not a dietitian here. Um, but I... Um, found Emily. I actually, I I graduated as a music ed music education teacher for elementary school. That's where I started, and then I became a stay at home mom. So I was a stay at home mom for like six years, and I was very. I felt very isolated and stuck where I was, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And so I thought weight loss was the solution. And so I chased that for years, and um, I found Emily, and she helped me realize that that's not who you are and that eating more can like really change your life. And she really has impacted my life. And so earlier you mentioned how like clients had go to like past clients can work mm -hmm. for. And so she reached out to me and was like, Hey, look, like there's value in your experience. People relate to you. You are a successful client of mine. Like let's do this. And I was like, really? <laughs> what? And so it, it felt great to like, have value in my like horrible experience with like yo-yo dieting for years and like have something great come out of it um so it's been an awesome experience i think kristen likes to downplay like her <laughs> like coaching abilities but yes the point being like i found i saw kristen like incredibly relatable and a natural coach this is emily field talking um <laughs> but uh yeah i i think that one of the things that kristen does really well is we we lead with uh maybe a lot of dietitians that might be listening to this or already to be that are listening to this might lead with their experience or i'm sorry their academics what Kristen leads with is her experience. And I think that's incredibly val valuable to her clients. So she sees clients on her own. She also supports my business. And another thing that you're doing uh, that you've shared with me that is really cool is that you like you have another outlet. It's a career move. Like it's not like a side hustle for you. Mm -hmm. And and fortunately, like 
some people in your life or maybe that are looking at you might not think it's a real job, but it's truly a real job. And um, yeah, the more you sink your teeth into it, just because it's a small number of hours per week or it's just your own schedule or you're working from home does not mean it's not a real job. It's not a career move because it totally is. I think one thing bringing up the fact that she is not a dietitian, sometimes people probably ask us all, I'm thinking about like, I'm interested in nutrition. Should I go back to school for this? And I'm like, Hmm, I'm not like, <laughs> do you want to go to school for that long to do, to then have another mountain? To unlearn what you just <laughs> yeah, Maria, tell us, you know, you were a second career dietitian. Um, is that worthwhile? And then like, what is our opinion about that? Because you have like, Kristen, you're able to work this thing that you love without doing that by working in someone's space and finding, and maybe you guys want to tell a little bit about like what Kristen does in your business to help people understand, like there's opportunities Mm -hmm. for people who, and of course, teachers can do everything. (laughs) Did you hear, did you catch that there was two teachers at this table? So love each other. (laughs) They can do, they, they get, they can do things, right? Like they're, they're resilient and resourceful. So those are good good traits but anyway sure is it worth it yeah this is maria um i felt that because of my proximity to drexel so i'm from philadelphia originally and being able to go back to school to drexel which really catered to career changers was the move because i needed the connections so drexel was very well connected in sports which i love my research project was in um whew, it was it was everything we were calculating the intake and the vo2 max the rmr and the we did dexa scans of professional and recreational athletes and it was it changed my whole life never saw myself in a lab never saw myself going speaking at acsm basically blacked out but i did it (laughs) um i never saw myself working with you know the person who wrote my sports nutrition textbook like that's it was incredible so in some ways i feel like schools would allow me to get where i am to realize not only do I really struggle with the nutrition program at my gym, but I can change it. And I have the knowledge to do that. So I think for me, it gave me confidence. And the program was so streamlined. It's two years with summers off. So I could get lots of experience. Um, and I was able to use my teaching degree to teach nutrition education in Philadelphia public schools, which I would not have had the ability to do without Drexel, mm-hmm. um, without the SNAP grants and the things like, you know, that come with those academic programs. However, what I do now does it require my RD? Does it require the years of schooling that I've since had to unlearn? There's a lot in dietetics that needs to be revamped. And I find I'm trying not to be resentful of that, I'm trying to be open-minded. Um, so there is some give and take with going back to school. And there's the, the take is obviously on your credit and your, <laughs> your bank account. Um, I was very lucky to have a partner who had a job with benefits. So in some ways, I think, could I have maybe reached out to Emily and said, this is something I'm interested in. Do you need an intern? Do you need, like, maybe I could have gone that route and still achieved, you know, essentially the same work I'm doing now, potentially, but I didn't. And I'm grateful for my journey. I'm grateful I went back to school, but I don't necessarily think it is the only way Mm -hmm. to impact people, to remind them that their worth is not their weight, Mm -hmm. that they can eat more food. And here's why it's not proprietary. It's not something that is only made in a school classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it really depends on what are you looking for, what programs are available to you, and you streamline that process, mm-hmm. and you get an internship that's virtual, that is flexible, that is affordable. Um, ultimately, I think the field really gatekeeps, right? It keeps dietitians looking and talking the same. And so diversity is incredibly important for us to be able to help more people. And so maybe, maybe schooling isn't the end all be all to mm-hmm. helping more people experience brings depth. I just want to bridge a couple things really quickly because you already had at least a bachelor's degree. Yes. So you were able to add on a master's degree and were you able to bundle in a basically year long internship within those two years? Did you have to do that in addition? I had to do that in addition. And I also spent a year getting basic credits, like taking college level science again, because it was an English degree. I had an English yeah. degree, right? So I just like breathed through like life science. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, sure. I'll just like, <laughs> it's like, okay, sure. Um, had to redo a lot of classes or re- I, the last psychology class I took was in high school, AP psych. So I had to retake a lot. So for the first year, I actually had to put in that grunt work of then getting into a master's program. Uh, but I did have the degree to start with, which was a helpful leg up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you didn't have that, it would be a bit more time. It would have been a four year, um, four year degree process. So fortunately it was four years, but it's four years with the internship. 
Mm -hmm. Um, I would imagine we all would agree that no matter if you go the RD route or another route, mm -hmm. you need the physiology, Mm -hmm. the the basic. That's the depth. Like how the the body works. Yeah. That's the experience. Like even if you have feelings about your education, you know, even as teachers, did you go to school and then jump in with what you used in college or did you have to learn other stuff anyway? This is Maria. (laughs) And yes, you had to learn. You had to learn about personalities and classroom management outside of a vacuum. So there's so much you had to learn by observing other people and having a mentor and having someone peep into your classroom and say, I don't think that's working for you. I'm sure that's what you learned in school, but that's actually not how it's going to work here. So in so many ways, yes, there was a lot of uh, external support that you just didn't apply everything you learned from a theory. Yeah. We just talked yesterday about like people get imposter syndrome and think they need X, Y, Z. You do need to have skills in some capacity. You have to have some skills you can apply. Do you have anything to add to that, Kristen, as being a teacher and now doing what you're doing? Or do you feel like, I think like no matter what, you're not going to know what you're doing initially. And that's why you seek mentorship. But Right. Well, for the longest time, like I have been a battle, like i I feel like I've grown up with some people that knew what they wanted to do with their life. And I had no idea. And I was very good at music. I love music. I loved teaching music. When I went to school, when I finally became a teacher, I was like, oh my gosh, did I waste four years of my life like becoming a music education teacher? And I don't love this. Like, am I supposed to love my job? And so I felt lost for so long. And then motherhood happened and like going back to school felt really daunting. And so, um, Find getting into the nutrition space like helped me realize that I can lean into my talents that are creativity and um, really connecting with people and coaching. Like I am really good at that, and I can lean into that. I don't have to go back to school. I can work with someone who is a professional. Um, and I think that's why I'm such a great team with Emily. Well, Emily squared both Emily <laughs> um, because we're all great at something. Like we all have our own skill set and we work really well together because we're, di- we're great at something that's very different. And though we feed off of each other and it's fun. It's fun work. So um, by nature, we've already given some advice to early business owners, but like, what are you guys, I'll just like start back around and whoever wants to go. Um, like if you could tell an early, like when you watch, because Robin, you have a, you have a program that helps people get into integrated functional nutrition and Kaylee, you do too. They are a little bit different programs, but they're both wonderful. Um, but you guys like see firsthand kind of what this looks like in people and what are the, the issues that you sometimes see or, or instead maybe queuing it up to like, what's your advice to someone that's trying to, or considering starting a business? Like what are f- things, mistakes you see or advice you'd want to give someone? I think imposter syndrome shows up in a lot of ways, and that can really be something that holds someone back. Maybe that's holding them back from going, even starting the business or doing something around marketing to get their first clients, or there's just a lot of ways that that can show up. And I think you have to be really gentle on yourself. This profession tends to be like kick yourself in the ass, which is not necessarily the way to get through imposter syndrome. Um, So, I mean... We can all chip in with advice on how to handle imposter syndrome, but that's just one area that I think go no knowing that everyone experiences it, everyone at this table, anytime you're doing something new, we all still feel that. Like that's part of entrepreneurship. And then I think it was interesting to hear two people with teaching backgrounds getting into what you're doing now. And I think there's this misconception that you'll go through a program like your schooling. And you'll come out like ready to help people (laughs) and you get no training on how to coach people on how to interface with real humans. And I think a lot of new practitioners that I see are like, God, I just spent all this time and money in this program. Why do I feel inept to actually coach people? And it's like helping people understand that you have to just jump in and start doing this because that's where you learn. And that's why you can go from like a teaching background to being a really great coach because it's how you relate and help people. It's not something that's going to be taught in a classroom. So it's like, one, knowing that we all go through this, we've all been there, nobody comes out of school feeling like ready to coach people really well, but you have to be willing to start and know that all of that learning happens like in real time with actual people, like nothing theoretical is going to get you there. You don't get to skip it. Like you no. don't get to skip not knowing what you're doing. No, nope. it's uncomfortable <laughs> and we want to skip uncomfortable things, but you just can't. <laughs> 
What about um the kind of, this actually brought me back to like, oh, I forgot that my experience with this was like basically not getting paid and affiliating for a fitness brand for a second because I was unhappy with myself. So sometimes your own journey, and actually I think that's where a lot of people decide that they're interested in nutrition or con- like question, should I do this? And like that's you, Kristen, mm-hmm. right? That's probably many of us is like, I'm gonna try fixing myself mm-hmm. or I'm gonna go on a journey of healing and fixing myself. And that's a useful that's always important. <laughs> it's always important your own experiences. But what do you guys think about um, niching um, for early businesses? Because everyone's like, that's the answer to getting all the business is niching. I started, this is Emily. I, as a reminder, started at a CrossFit gym and I literally was like, um, I'll help anyone and just come at me, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> I will help you with your heart disease. I'll help you with your cholesterol. I'll help you train for a triathlon. I'll help anyone and what I quickly realized is like I've got a process and a method and a slant on nutrition that works for the right clients you start matching up your process with the right client but I could not have developed that if I didn't talk to a lot of people um so yeah I mean it's it is a um I guess I guess we see in the space right now a take on business coaching which is form a niche find your people they will find you um or help as many people as you can to get reps and learn your method. And um, I fall into that camp. I think that's the better advice, but that's really my experience. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other experience where they started with a niche, but I think everyone at this table started with the reps. They started with the, whoever I can help, I will help them. It wasn't always a great fit. Like it was not great. It was not comfortable. There were, you know, I don't know. So I just think you, I think reps matter. Totally. And it's not comfortable. It's also not fast. And this is Kaylee. forgot about that. <laughs> but it's like the opposite of uh, an area of business coaching for our field. That's like you immediately come in, you pick a very narrow niche and like stay in that space. And I wouldn't have found where I am now unless I was willing to help anyone and everyone in the beginning mm-hmm. and be uncomfortable and take the time. Mm-hmm. And it's funny that all of us have done that. Mm-hmm. You've got to figure oh, out. Why not? <laughs> you got to figure out how to help people. If you, yeah. you can't, if you have just been doing diabetes education, which is the co- a very common thing, you know, in clinical dietetics, you didn't get the opportunity to coach all kinds of other types of things. If you have RA or if you've got some other autoimmune condition or if you've got IBS, if you have never experienced those, how can you confidently say that you can help that? And if you can't help get one get results because you have no experience, your confidence is going to plummet. And so is your bank account, because I think like the most, like the thing that matters the most, which is really the same thing on like getting a job is like, you got to have some skills Mm -hmm. and how are you going to build skills if you don't suck at something first? Right. Well, I'll try it. Yeah. This is Emily Morris. Um, I would add to that, that, so you can cast that net and see any clients in private practice. But in my world, that was kind of jumping around between different job, different jobs. Like I wasn't seeing all those clients in private practice, but I worked in, um, I wrote menus for jail, uh, jails all over the country. Like that was one of my jobs. And then I was in a working for a health insurance company. And then I worked in like an outpatient setting. And so I had those experiences of seeing different clients and different types of, or different ways to practice nutrition. And I kept feeling like this isn't the right fit. This isn't the right fit until I finally, you know, found the good fit of like, I want to work in private practice and have more flexibility with my job, but I want to be behind the scenes. I don't want to be that person. So whether that experience is working with different types of clients or just working in different jobs until you find what you like, I think there's kind of two different avenues to see, to do that. If someone looks like they have become an overnight success or a really quick success, (laughs) it's probably an exception or a facade. (laughs) Laughter is the best medicine. I'm going to wrap the episode there and give you part two at the very beginning of next week so you don't have to wait. On the second part of this episode, things that you'll get from there is coaching and mentorship conversations, like frank conversations about what you should do with getting help, getting to the next level of your career. And also, what are some of the things that these women didn't know they'd be telling their clients later in your career? So if you want to have another good laugh, come back next week and make sure you hear part two. And if you found this episode helpful, share it with a friend and please leave us a review on iTunes. Have a great week.